Welcome to Information Matters, a television series that explores how people use information to make decisions, solve problems, innovate, and have fun. This series is brought to you by the University of Washington Information School, which studies information and its role in people's lives. On this program, we'll look at how people in sports use information to build winning teams. Laura Schildkraut talked first with Lorenzo Romar, head coach of the University of Washington men's basketball program, about building a successful team. So coach, how early in the season do you start thinking about recruiting for next season? We give that a lot of thought. We're thinking two and three years ahead. We're thinking when this current group of freshmen are seniors, what are we going to need to complement them? What are we going to be losing? How do, we need, how do we replace these guys? So I'd say two or three years ahead we start thinking about the next year's recruiting. In terms of actually putting a team out on the floor, I think once you start to recruit these kids for the next year, you're thinking of how it will look on the floor because that's why you're recruiting them so that they can fit on the floor and how you're going to have the best chemistry. So you're looking probably one year ahead of time on that. Do you find that you plan primarily based on your current needs or are you looking out into the future? Both. There's some that you recruit that uh, you, you talk to the student athlete about this, that probably your junior and senior year you'll probably be more effective with us. And there's some others that are ready to go right there on the spot. There's some that uh, you know you've got a group of seniors that are going to be there during this kid's freshman year, but when those seniors are gone, he's going to be able to step right in behind them and pick up where they left off. So you've got to look at your current situation as well as the future. But when professional teams are recruiting, they have the luxury of a lot of information that's out there on the websites, it's out there from sports people writing about that. How do you get most of your information about the players you may be interested in bringing on board? A lot of the same thing. A lot of the scouting services, uh, uh, the, net, the, the network that we have as a coaching staff where uh, we're familiar with these coaches and their programs. We're constantly checking in, seeing what they have. Coaches will call and say, I've got a ninth grader that's going to be really good. You need to get on him right away and uh, make your presence felt. Well, then we'll start doing that. Word of mouth. Uh, um, someone, uh, one of our players' parents happened to be at a game somewhere in Michigan and say, wow, we found a kid that's not only good, but his, his uh, grandfather lives in Seattle and they have a lot of interest. Well, we didn't have any idea that they had that interest, so we'll find a way to get in contact with the kid and now he's on our radar screen. So there are multiple ways that we, that we use, mu multiple methods that we use to begin our recruiting. So you have a lot of different information coming in from a lot of different places. How do you tell which is reliable and which isn't? Well, anytime you see something in print, you've got to follow that up with questions. Uh, people are notorious for calling saying that we've got a can't miss player. And uh, I'll tell you a real quick story if I, if I might. Uh, they said we've got a, a, a seven footer from Africa that wants to come to the States, would like to come to your school and would you be interested? Well, yeah, seven footer, you know, and sure, well, a few months go by and they say, hey, I got great news. He's coming out to the States. You'll get a chance to meet him. And great. Yeah, he's, uh, he's about 6'11", though. More information, he's about 6'11". He finally gets to the state. They pick him up and they say, well, we saw him and he's more like 6'9". Uh, he finally comes up to the school and you see him in person. He's 6'5". So you've got to take a lot of that with a grain of salt because everyone says I got a can't miss some are just trying to help someone else yeah I know the coach is over there I can get you in you know and then when you see them the the guy just not very good so you have to kind of cipher through that but you follow up you ask a lot of questions with co uh, questions to coaches coaches that played against this particular player how good was he to you people that are neutral an unbiased opinion and you kind of follow that up if if it sounds like he's a player, then we'll send someone out and watch him and then we form our own opinion. With high school players very often you're probably looking almost more at potential. How do you evaluate potential? Well there are a number of factors that play into that. What type of feel does a kid have for the game? Is the game easy for him? Maybe he's not the best player right now, but uh, he, he, he sees the game two passes ahead. Uh, good passer, very good shooter, just has a pretty good feel for the game. What type of passion does this player have? If the player has a passion that they want to be the best, they're always in the gym trying to get better. 
well then they're going to pass up some others that may be a little more talented than they are. What type of drive do they have to be good? And, you know, you, you have to have some type of talent in that, in that package. But those are just a few of the factors that uh, we look at to, to when we start deciding potential. Okay, because as uh, one person told me, potential means you haven't done anything yet. There are some that are easy. That person, oh, he's going to be a great player. You can see it. That's not potential. That's reality there. But uh, the real trick is to find those with potential and to come in and do a good job in your program. Do you rely a lot on statistics? Uh, statistics get your attention, but they don't always uh, paint the most accurate picture. You read about some kid that's averaging 30 points a game uh, and 10 rebounds a game, and you just keep hearing, wow, he's leading the entire state in scoring. Well, when you finally get out to North Dakota to see him play, he's a six-foot center that's playing inside, can't handle the basketball, where he should be a guard. He doesn't have any guard skills, but because the competition is so poor, he's been able to get those numbers. So you really, when you see statistics, you want to know who is this player playing against. How do you evaluate fit for the team? You know what your team is about. You know what your philosophy is about. You, a lot of the same things. That personality, does his personality mesh with our team? Uh, his style of play, does the way he play mesh, mesh with our team? Uh, uh, what's this kid's philosophy? You put all those together and you decide if he fits in with your group. Have you ever found that you focus too much on a niche player and not enough on seeing the whole team? Sometimes that can happen. You, you get in your mind that uh, we just have to have a shooter. We have to have a shooter. And I was in a situation before where we just felt we had to have a shooter, but yet there was another player that was three times as good as this player, even though he wasn't quite the shooter he was. All the guy, the one guy could shoot, but he couldn't do much else. And, uh, you know, you, when it was all said and done, you wish you had taken the all-around player as, as opposed to just that one niche. How much does gut feel enter into making those decisions? With the experience, I think, becomes, you get more of a gut feel because you been through most cases before and that gut feel sometimes a guy said if you if you got a hunch you bet a bunch and sometimes you just got a hunch that man I really like this kid here and I've only seen him a couple of times but I just got a feel he's gonna be really good I, I think if you're experienced you've been there before you can trust your judgment you can trust your gut on those when you look back on the good decisions that you've made and then the ones that turned out to be not such good decisions, do you find that those tended to be more on gut feel or database decisions? Gut and emotion are two different things to me. And sometimes an emotional decision can backfire on you. Your gut, to me, if there's a gut feeling that I'm making, it's more because of past experiences. Uh, an emotional decision sometimes can come into play. Maybe you know the family from way back. Uh, this is a really good kid, so you want to take him. You look for other reasons to take him as opposed to the, the reality of what it really is. And those can backfire, backfire on you. So you need to keep your emotions out of it. Is there ever such a thing as having too much information? It can be. Then you fall into what we call paralysis by analysis. Now you begin to second guess everything that you did, everything that you're thinking. Now you're not sure what's going on. You, that happens sometimes. In the month of July, you can watch for three weeks, players play as much as you would like, unlimited evaluations. And by that third week, you've picked the player apart so much, you could end up not liking that player's <laughs> game, you know. So uh, you, you, you can't get distracted that way. You're interested for a reason, and unless there's something totally different than what you, what you, what you saw initially, you probably got to stick with that. When you're starting to think about who to focus on, do you start looking at the students who have more likelihood of coming here versus those who don't and factor that in? And how do you track all that information? You've got to be very careful. Uh, sometimes you can spin your wheels going after some kids that you've got no chance to ever get. And you spend all your dollars, you spend all your time, and um, you don't have a chance to get the kid. You've got to identify, do we really have a chance to get this kid? You can do that. Uh, by simply asking, although they, a lot of times they won't tell you. They, it's hard for them to tell an adult no and reject an adult. They're flattered because coaches are calling them. They don't just want to say no. They don't want to eliminate people before they totally get to know them. 
but uh, you, you still can ask him. And, and then you, you, know, you, you look at the environment. Is this a kid that's a thousand miles from here, but the parents are at everything, whatever he does, the parents are there. And he's just not going to leave home. You better determine that early. And on the flip side, if he's not going to leave home and he's in your area, you got to know that too. Mm -hmm. There have been kids over, over the course of me coaching where it didn't matter what was going on, they had a bad home life and they did not want to stay around home. So they were going to get out of town regardless. You got to know that going in. How do you go about organizing all the information that you collect or do you just tend to kind of keep it in your head? My assistants do a fantastic job of keeping all that organized. That We have files on recruits. We record a lot of things. We rec they record conversations, record birthdays, record all types of information on there so that if we want to know something about a certain kid, a lot of time we can just look it up on, on the computer. Collecting and managing information effectively are essential to building successful teams at the college or professional level. Laura Schildkraut talked with Mike Eisenberg, Dean Emeritus of the University of Washington Information School, about the role of an information professional. What are information professionals? Well, information professionals are people whose main focus is the gathering, use, and application of information to solve real problems. So you've got your traditional information professionals, librarians, which is a pretty complex uh, occupation that has been since the beginning of time, but it's changed even more so today because today the focus is on services and, and what you do with that information and reaching out into communities and stuff. The same thing happens as business situations. So you have somebody in a, a major corporation who is a systems analyst who works in an information unit headed by a chief information officer. And this is a person that sits right next to the chief financial officer, the CFO next to the CIO and the CEO in order to um, focus on the information aspects because information in these companies, in situations, is a strategic commodity that gives us an, a real advantage. So information professionals today, we find them in every situation. We find them in broadcasting, we find them in entertainment, we find them in sports. How do they use statistics in decision making? So yeah, the statistics are, are just the stuff, right? That's kind of low level. It's almost the data, right? And we need to put that together into information. So you want to tie that information to the kinds of needs that you have. Example, that we have a major need for linebackers. Right? So what we want to do is to cluster the kinds of information that help us to evaluate linebackers. Um, we also, it, it's more than just individual stats, it's the trends and what does it tell us about it. So it really is a matter of organizing and clustering. You know, in the information world we talk about taxonomies, we talk about databases and, and groupings and organizing, and then relationships and connections. So we're adding value to the data to make it information and then the information to make it knowledge for us. And so we would analyze various statistics, but it's, it's much beyond the actual statistics themselves. Also, the decision makers are not going to be the ones playing with the, the low level statistics. What they're going to do is to look for summaries and they have to make sure that those summaries are accurate. And a lot of it is putting together the statistics in different ways so that it, it provides the kinds of decision support that the, uh, the, the managers, the general managers, the, the vice presidents, and so, so forth, the coaches who will be making the decisions can make. And, and, and some of the differences among teams and the profile of the final product, but also the profile of the way that they approach the draft and everything else, is the way that they choose to organize the information, what information they rely on, and, and so forth. What is the concept of relevance, and how do you deal with the complexity around that? Well, relevance is an area close to my own heart. It's what I did my doctoral thesis on. And when people think about relevance, they usually mean, is it on the topic? If you search Google and you're looking for something that's relevant, you normally think about that you're looking for the thing that best matches what you're searching for. But it's actually not true. You're, there are other dimensions that come into relevance. So you want things that are reliable, accurate, and that's part of relevance as well. You may want things that are new and novel that you haven't seen before. Oh, I've seen all those. It's not relevant, even though it's right on the topic that you were interested in. How can a team find out whether the information they have is reliable? Well, 
So the, the, the highest form of reliability testing is verifiability, right? And that is that that information you find from more than one source. And that's why you have scouts and you may check the internet for information and then you may test the players and whatever. And if those things agree, then you know that that information is reliable. So a given single piece of information is not reliable until it's been triangulated or verified in more than one way. How is recruiting players into a college program different from professional recruiting? So the average career of a professional player is two years or so. When you think about it, you, you, a lot of these guys last a long time, which means there's a lot of players that are there for six months or whatever. But it's a very short career in prof professional sports. Where in college sports, it's four or five because they'll bring players in their first year and they, they redshirt. They don't play that first year. So the player's there for five years. So it's a, it's a totally different thing. Um, also, the, the NFL, most of the players who they would potentially draft, it, they're all known quantities, right? Um, where college, you're recruiting high school players and things like that. So you're tracking kids um, for a much longer time frame. Um, and you've got geographical considerations and whatever. So in many ways, the college recruiting it has many more variables than even the, uh, the pro game in some ways. A lot more unknowns. Well, as you mentioned, that there's a lot of information that they know at the professional level that you may not know recruiting at the college level. Mm -hmm. How do you know whether the information that you're receiving from high school coaches, et cetera, is credible? Well, you, you don't. And that's the first rule, is that the reliability, again, um, is, is, is probably not right there. Although, remember, a certain coach will have a reputation, and that coach wants to keep that reputation. So if I sell a player to you, you're the, the college, and I say I've got this great player, and he's terrific, and he turns out to be a real bust, um, that's going to affect your view of me next time. Um, so while I may exaggerate, I'm not going to exaggerate too much. And there's that whole mix and things. So there is the reputation of the coach. There's this, the same triangulation, this same verifiability from different sources. So I have the, 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 the coach. I have the uh, information about their performance. They're in a certain league, in a certain area. And um, I know um, that that's a very strong league and players coming out of that and what have you. I have the film so I can analyze it myself. So there's also the, the, the live scouting and things, and there are limitations on that. You're only allowed to see a certain player a certain number of times or in a certain number of contexts. You can't interact with them at certain time periods. I mean, keeping track of the rules, when there are violations, it's because either the coaches are making mistakes inadvertently, and I have trouble believing there's a lot of inadvertent mistakes, or they're trying to gain a competitive information advantage, either of information they're gathering or of contacts with the players. Also, what's very, very important in the college coach recruiting is the relationship of that coach to the potential player, to the recruit. So there's now a new rule that the NBA is no longer to recruit high school players directly out of high school. They need to wait until I believe they're 19 years old. Mm -hmm. How does that change the recruiting landscape? So, so it does affect their choices quite a bit because uh, a team has to decide not just on their strategy on the court or something like that, but their overall team strategy. Are you gonna recruit a player who's just gonna be with us for one year um, and will then be gone and we'll just put together a team that way or whatever, or are we going to take the strategy? No, we're going to recruit players for four years, we're going to develop them over four years and work them in together and what, what have you. Um, and that's a totally different strategy, it requires a whole lot more and then a chemistry of the team, our uh, style of play, all kinds of things. Um, you know, and, and so that's a, a decision a coach and a program, maybe even the whole university, has to really consider. As you look at recruiting somebody onto a college team, obviously you need to look at the skills, both hard and soft, and fit for the team. What other elements are important when you're looking at bringing someone onto a college campus? Well, there, there's the academics, obviously, that um, college players going to Division I and there are NCAA rules again, they need to succeed at that college. They are truly student athletes, and you know, it's a pretty tough 
game. You know, the average student on the campus may have a job, but they don't have a job where their performance is being evaluated at the level of the college athlete, and they must, you know, practices and study tables and all the other. So, you know, the, the students must perform in the classroom. And uh, uh, the universities, various universities have different standards and different levels. And there, there are, uh, you know, we're at the University of Washington. We're a very high academic performing university. And the classrooms here are much more competitive than they might be at another school. So we have to find a, a student who's going to succeed. And there's, there's, there's no advantage for the university, for the student, to have a mismatch. So you, you really want to figure out that the student has a chance to succeed at, at your school. Now, there are support systems built in, um, but ultimately, it's got to be a good fit. In a way, when you think about it, we're recruiting Huskies for life. What, what I mean is that we're not just recruiting kids who are going to play with us for four years. They're going to be part of the University of Washington community for the rest of their lives. And that's a really big deal. And um, particularly at this school, that, that's very important. And so um, you're looking for a long-term fit. You were looking for people to represent your university. We're really, and, and our coaches now, um, the coaches for the football, the basketball programs, and the others, this is a, is a really big deal for us. So there's a lot of information that a team will get on the players. What kind of information does the team need to give a player that they're trying to recruit to tell them about the university? Well, there's, there's all kinds of information there as well. And some of it is uh, the attractiveness part, but some of it has to be the real depth uh, about what we really are. Because again, you, don't, you want to attract these young people, but you don't want to mislead or you don't want to have them have a false impression because then there'll be a mismatch sometime, you know, the rubber will meet, will meet the role. So they need to know about the academics, the range of programs, what's available. They need to know about the support structures, the, the requirements in the academic side and whatever. They need to know about the team and the approach that the, the coach takes, um, the nature of the style of play. Um, is it a run and gun for basketball versus a more um, structured, um, methodical kind of play and does that fit their their style and those kinds of things. Um, is the school uh, known for long-term commitments and this family kind of concept and 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 commitment to to the players or is it which is fine that is it's a place where people come to but there's not a whole lot of contact over time so you really do are, are the do the parents of, of players uh, is, it a, is it a warm and an engaged environment where they're involved as, as well? Um, what are the other things related to the student life? What about um, how do they handle majors for athletes? Do the, is every opportunity at the university, is there a major that's appealing to the, to the student athlete today? Well, this must be a very daunting decision for a young person. How should they go about organizing and evaluating the information? That's a great question. I'm really, I'm really glad you asked it. Um, it's a daunting for any young person, um, whether they're an athlete or not. And I really think they should go about it in a fairly systematic way, at least from the information side. And it is very much like the big six, right? First of all, define your task. What, what are the parameters of the, of the place that you want to go to? Um, what are you looking for? What are the most important things? Uh, what does it relate to size of school and what size of environment? Um, what kinds of majors? It's not, and it's not all about major. You know? What is the, the, the style of learning that, that you are um, drawn to? Um, what is the nature of the, uh, of the opportunities and the, and the community and those things? And once you've kind of narrowed that, then do your information search so that you're seeking out a range of information sources so you as the student and maybe the family are doing that same verification reliability. You know, where are you getting your information from and is it, is it verifiable? Can you rely on that information? And then as you begin to weigh the choices that you, you go back to your task and figure out what were the priorities, right? Is it just one thing? Now, for an athlete it may be the opportunity to grow in a program, the opportunity to hone their skills, and, and maybe they are someday going to try to go on to the professional ranks. And so maybe that's the most important thing. For another, it might be, well, you know, I, I, I want to do well, but 
I realize that my college career is so important for me in terms of the academics as well that I want to make sure that I have a, a major that I'm interested in and that the class size and my learning style and all those other things. So I, I really think we need to think about this as an information problem and have them f solve it that way. So what is this big six? Well, the big six is a, it's a process for solving information problems. And there are six stages, task definition, information seeking strategies, location and access, use of information, synthesis, and evaluation. And each one has different aspects to it to carry it out. So task definition, what is my task? What types of information do I need to meet that task? Information seeking strategies, what are my choice of resources? What is the best resource? Location and access, how do I find and get my hands on that information? Use of information, how do I extract what's relevant? Synthesis, how do I grab that information and put it together to solve a problem or reach a decision? And evaluation, have I succeeded? And how well did I do in the process? So the big six doesn't have to be linear, it doesn't have to be done in order, but these are the pieces of information problem solving. So you're the Dean Emeritus and a faculty member of the University of Washington's Information School. What is the focus of the iSchool? Well, the focus of the iSchool is about information. And, you know, so we've got, people know what a B school is, a business school, and they know what an engineering school, and they know what a biology department is. But imagine in our day and age, in the 21st century, that you want a, a school, a unit that, that researches and teaches and studies and focuses on information, its use, uh, adding value to it, application in different situations. We have theories, we have research and literature, and we have a lot of application in, in a lot of real settings. Thank you for watching Information Matters, a program of the University of Washington Information School. The iSchool supports, facilitates, and enriches human engagement with information and technology. The iSchool helps people find and effectively use the information they need to work, make decisions and choices for their families, and pursue their interests. For more information about the iSchool, visit www.ischool.washington.edu or call 206-685-9937.